Uh, welcome everybody. We um, keep joining. We will be happy to have as many of you as, as, as possible. And uh, um, I, meanwhile, for the sake of timing, uh, I will start uh, the, uh, with, the, with the presenters today. So we have two subsections in this uh, first part of the webinar. Uh, the first one is on uh, machine learning with uh, a total of six presentations. And uh, we will keep off the uh, um, multimedia and computer vision web seminar of the week of this week with a presentation from uh, Mr. Budi Bellis, uh, who is going to talk about uh, machine learning inter interpretability. All the other presenters will just introduce the, the topic themselves. So I am not going to say much uh, in, in the remaining of the session. I am just going to do the timing to make sure that we finish uh, on time. And we have also the allocated uh, uh, 15 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, please uh, feel, feel free to uh, ask questions, writing them down in the uh, Q&A uh, section of, the, of this uh, tool. And we will be happy to get back to you in the uh, Q&A session. OK, uh, uh, Budi, uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Hi. Um... Right, let me share my screen. Okay. Hello. Hello. I'm Woody Bate, and this is my quick fire presentation on the work I've been doing on machine learning interpretability and image filtering. Now, the first question that we have to consider is why is interpretability important for machine learning algorithms? Well, it's always important to understand why an algorithm has made the decision that it's made. In the example that you're seeing on screen, you can see on the left a husky that has been misclassified by an artificial intelligence as a wolf. And on the right, you can see the explanation that the artificial intelligence has given, i.e. the most important points of this image to identify this husky as a wolf ends up being the snow indicating that the AI has not actually learnt the difference between huskies and wolves, it's learnt the difference between huskies and snow. Now this might not seem like a big problem when you're trying to tell the difference between a husky and a wolf, but say you have an artificial intelligence in charge of a military drone. Say it's in charge of trading on the stock market or investing your savings. Say it's in charge of multiple appliances in your house. You would want to understand why the AI has made certain decisions when it comes to these scenarios. Or perhaps you just want to understand why the new AI toaster that you bought last week keeps burning your toast. Images and video are often compressed using lossy algorithms. This means that data is lost as the compression is applied. When the AI tries to replace the quality that was lost through compression, it must hallucinate pixels and invent data where there was none before. Uncontrolled hallucinations with AI are great for certain circumstances, one here being art exhibitions. However, you would not want this uncontrolled process to occur on a live broadcast system. This is why my work has been split into these two categories. It is important to leverage AI to produce better video compression and image compression at lower bit rates. But it's just as important, if not more important, to understand how this system performs in all scenarios and to make sure that there are not certain edge cases where an AI algorithm like the ones explained in this video would cause issues for live broadcast. The only way to have a scenario like this is to have a fully interpretable AI so that its decisions can be predicted at every point and are never surprising. In my talk, I'll be going over a few new novel approaches to interpret these algorithms, and I'll also be exploring how image filtering currently works in artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muted, bro.
Uh, sorry. Yeah. I, uh, thank you, Woody, uh, and uh, good timing. Can we move move to the next presentation, which is uh, Chen Feng, please? Okay. And meanwhile, can a uh, uh, Raymond Juan get ready, please? Hi, guys. Okay. In Chen Feng from Multimedia and Vision Group, I'm supervised by Professor Yanis Patras. I'm going to introduce my recent book in self-supervised representation learning. As we all know, it's difficult and expensive to collect enough and high-quality human annotated labels, so self-supervised learning is becoming more and more popular currently, especially the contrastful learning method. Our work is focusing on how to improve contrastful learning. So what is contrast learning? The basic idea is pretty simple. We all know the identity of an image will not change even if moderate transformations have been made. Which means if we enforce the representations of views from the same image to be close to each other, while the views of different images to be far from each other, we can learn a transformation invariant and distinguishable representation of each image without human annotated labels. However, at the same time, the contrast laws introduced a new problem. In this mini batch, we can find two cats' image will be considered to negative samples by each other. This problem motivated me to consider more intersample relations in contrastful learning. We did extensive experiments with current contrastful networks. The learned representations showed superior performance in nearest neighbor labeling accuracy. We can find the accuracy is pretty good in CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, SDL 10, and even ImageNet. In the MNIST test, the similar digits will be projected to adjacent area in low dimensions. A more detailed comparison to related works has proved that contrast learned representations beat those previous works completely, even though that these, those works was designed specially for unsupervised clustering. So in the future, we are going to design more appropriate novel metrics to describe the intersample relations. And if possible, we hope to combine <coughs> the proposed strategies with semi-supervised and supervised learning methods. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Um, Raymond Huang, and can please Pan Lee get ready? Yes. One second on my way. Oh, sorry. So you can see my video now. Yes, please go, go on. Okay. Deep semantic clustering by partition. Hi there. I'm glad to be here to introduce our recent work in CVPR 20, named Deep Semantic Clustering by Partition Confidence Maximization. The problem we started here is deep semantic clustering, in which we would like to derive the underlying class boundaries according to the raw imagery data instead of their pre-chained or handcrafted representation so that the learned clusters can be mapped to the ground truth classes one-to-one. -one. In literature, the conventional cluster analysis is restricted when the given image representations are indiscriminative, while the existing deep clustering matters suffer from either error propagation or semantic bias. In this work, we would like to train a deep clustering model by explicitly maximizing the semantic possibility of clustering solution.
And our motivation is that even though different semantic concepts are given different labels in supervised training, samples from semantically similar classes are closer to each other in feature space than those from dissimilar ones. And this indicates that the intersample's distances is closely related to image visual similarity. With such observation, we made the, the assumption that assigning semantically similar samples into different clusters by reduce the within cluster compactness and between cluster diversity, in other words, will lead to less separable clusters. Inspired by the maximal margin clustering, we propose to quantify the cluster separability by partition confidence using a new partition uncertainty index. By explicitly minimizing such index, we train our model to learn the most separable clusters so to improve their semantic plausibility. Here is an overview of our proposed model. Given a set of unlabeled imagery data, we first fit them into a randomly initialized convolutional neural network to get the assignments probabilities of samples, and then we describe each cluster by an assignment statistic vector denoted as ASV here, which is uh, determined by the probability it contains every sample. With such cluster-wise description, we then compute the partition uncertainty index between two clusters by the cosine similarity of their representation. And the learning objective is then to minimize the PUI between every cluster pairs, so to maximize the partition confidence and improve the semantic plausibility of the final solution. We compare the proposed matter with the state-of-the-art approaches on six challenging benchmarks, and the results demonstrate its superiority on deep semantic cluster. And we also provide a detailed ablation study and qualitative studies for in-depth analysis. Our code is also available online, so please feel free to play around and also reach us for any question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now we have a Pan, Pan Lee presenting. And can please Ali get ready? Ever, I think he's still got having problems. Having problems. Uh, okay, uh, let's, let's, yeah, let's move on to the next one. Good. Let, let's move to the next one. Ali, please. Sure. And can please uh, Dr. Change get ready? Can you see my screen, please? Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali Shain Shamsawadi, supervised by Andrew Cavallero. Today, I will present Colorful. Semantic Adversarial Colorization that is published in CBPR 2020. An adversarial image is an image which is carefully computed to be misclassified. For example, in this case, you go from the suit to the kimono. The adversarial perturbation shouldn't distort the visual quality of the images and ideally maintain the aspect ratio. Also, Adversarial images should be robust to defenses that apply defense-based uh, input-based transformation, such as optimization, <clears throat> median smoothing, or JPEG compression. And adversarial images should be transferable to unseen classifiers, so not only misleading the seen classifier, but also unseen. And ideally, the knowledge of the attacker should be limited, for example, only to output of the classifier, which is black box in this case. If we look at the adversarial images in the literature, non-bonded perturbations such as BIM, TIBIM, DeepFool, or SPARTFUL, they generate unnoticeable adversarial images. However, they are, transfer they are not transferable and they are not robust. Instead, recently semantic adversarial introduced a large range of perturbation in the last column based on the image properties here, its color to improve the robustness and the transferability. But as you can see, the images look unnatural to human eyes. So in this paper, we propose a semantic adversarial colorization black box attack that exploit the characteristics of the human visual system to selectively alter colors of the semantic regions. So to do that, we decompose the image to sensitive region and non-sensitive region. Sensitive regions are those regions whose color is important for a human observer, such as vegetation, water, a sky, or a skin of the 
color of the person. Instead, non-sensitive regions may have their colors modified in any arbitrary range, but they still look natural. And we perform the colorization in the LAV color space because it's perceptually motivated. And in addition to this, the LAV color space express the lightness separately from the color information. As you can see in this image, the lightness is represented with L from zero to 100, and the color is represented by A channel, for example, from green to red, and B channel from blue to yellow. Colorful, our proposed attacks, operate only on the decorrelated A and B channel in the LAB color space. So as you can see in this figure, colorful only introduce perturbation within a natural color range or a specific semantic categories. For example, blue regions are considered for water and sky, vegetation are colorized in the green area, and we don't touch the color of the people in the images. And we did evaluation on three data sets, three classifier, and compare with five state of the art. As you can see, colorful generate natural looking adversarial images. And this is confirmed by the opinion scores of people participated in our experiment and colorful is more transferable than norm-bounded attacks and also robust to this kind of defenses, quantization median. And thank you very much for your attention. And you can have the code in this link. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Arli. Uh, good timing too. Um, can I ask, is Isa here? I can see Isa. Anyway, OK. Uh could I just uh, I just got the presentation from Penny um, I can play that now okay please go ahead go ahead okay um, let me play that Hold on, just give me one sec. Uh, I need to fire it up in the right order. It's okay. Let's let's move to uh, Dr. Changle, and then uh, okay. Can is, you see is, it? Is there. Yeah, we can see it. Go on. Hello, everyone. I'm Pan Li, a second year PhD student, supervised by Professor Shao Gang. This work aims to optimize student label for semi-supervised future learning. First, we will introduce some related settings. For few short learning, given a large scale label data from base classes and several label data from novel classes, we need to train a model which can well recognize the data from novel classes. But in many realistic settings, there are some valuable unlabeled data. This formulates the setting of semi supervised future learning. However, the existing method for semi supervised future learning always based on pseudo labeling strategy. And it easily causes the label noise problem, which can affect the model's performance. This motivates us to study the problem of how to reduce the label noise. First, we propose a simple method named plan. It first trains a feature extractor on base classes, and then use causing similarity to get an initial field class pair, which can assess initial field label for unlabeled data by ranking their confidence. We can select reliable ones to refine the future class fair. By iterative refinement, we can reduce the label noise gradually. However, plan is hard to reduce the label noise in each iteration. So we use an extra end-to-end -end network to learn from scratch on novel classes, which can help the model to adapt on novel classes and get the denoised pseudo label. With the initial pseudo label and the denoised pseudo label, we can compute their loss and use GMM to fit their loss dis distribution, which can help to distinguish the clean pseudo label and the noisy pseudo label. By selecting the clean ones, we can get the refined pseudo label. The Tisney visualization shows that plan can reduce the label noise to some extent, and the plan plus plus can further reduce the label noise significantly. 
We also do experiments on two popular future learning designs. The results show that our simple clone method can surprisingly achieve the competitive performance with the existing complex sort method. And our plan plus plus method can outperform exist sort method by reduce reducing the label noise. That's all. Thank you. Hello everyone. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay then. Yeah, let's get started. So Hi everyone, I'm Chang Jae Oh and I'm a lecturer at X. And in this presentation, I'll talk about our work on adversarial images. So first I would like to introduce an adversarial image. Uh, adversarial image is an original image with some perturbations, which leads the misclassification. And as you can see in this figure, the DNA classifier predicts the original image as a flower pot, but uh, when the perturbation is added, then the classifier predicts the adversarial images as a trash can. And the adversarial images can be used to protect our private information to be passed or uh, saved by other computers or servers. So for this case, we, set, uh, we can set some conditions for a good adversarial image. A good adversarial image can be unnoticeable to human eyes, as you can see in these two figure. Uh, in these two different adversarial images. And second, good adversarial images should be transferable to unseen classifier, uh, which means that the adversarial images should be able to mislead uh, the unseen classifier as, as well as the seen classifier used for the training. And lastly, a good adversarial image can be undetectable to some uh, uh, defense framework. And these three properties are those we consider in this work. So yeah, in this work, we present H4, which shows the improved transferability, uh, reduced detectability with image enhancement. So let's see how H4 works. First, we start from the image filtering uh, that preserves the edges uh, to obtain the structure image. And our learnable deep neural network learns to generate this uh, structure image. And this structure image can be used to extract the detail from an original image to perform an image enhancement. And lastly, we also add an adversarial loss to mislead the known classifier. And this training can be done in an end-to-end -end manner so uh, that we can obtain the adversarial image with an enhancement output. Okay, let me briefly introduce the result uh, with some images. So constrained approaches, uh, which uh, adds the perturbation with the small magnitude Small, yeah. Yeah, these uh, constrained approaches show the unnoticeable adversarial images, but they have low transferability and high detection rate. And one method in a uh, constrained method SA shows our uh, color distortion, which can be unnatural looking. And our, uh, compared to these methods, uh, our work at full generates image enhancement output with improved transferability and detectability. Okay, thanks for watching and please check our paper and code for more details and examples. Thank you. Thank you, Changhe. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so this, uh, this, uh, with this presentation, we closed the, this small subsection on machine learning and we move to the uh, next subsection, which has uh, uh, four papers, but I am missing one presenter. So I, I will start with the second presenter, which is uh, Bing Queen Gu. Bing Queen. Hi, hello. Yeah, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. So I'm gonna share my share my screen. Yeah. Can you say it? Yes. Okay. Loud and clear. Okay. <laughs> Oh, sorry, we, we lost you. Um, as soon sorry? as I say loud, we lost you. Uh, we, we are not here. But uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we, we can see the screen, but we, we, uh, we were not able to hear you. Now, now, uh, now I hear you. Are, are you playing the video and the audio or are you talking? Uh, I'm playing the video. Uh, I'm playing the video now. 
Uh, uh, no, sorry, we can't. The, the audio layer of the video is not coming through. Um, can I try this way? At SME 2020 workshop yes. and ICPR 2020 conference, respectively. Can you restart the video from, from yeah, from, from yeah, Hi. exactly. My name is Inxingu. It is it's my previous presentation. My research topic is analysis of painting styles with deep features and uh, style innovation. And my work has been written as two papers, which has been accepted at SME 2020 workshop and ICPR 2020 conference, respectively. And my two main tasks is that in this topic is to analyze the similarity level between generated features from CNN and the characteristics of artistic style movement from an authentic aesthetic perspective. Second is to construct a style space which enables style innovation using integration of known styles. We finish this task mainly by low level features and the high level features of paintings. And here a more detailed description of image features and the style features. Here are the generated uh, dis uh, distance maps. We compare them with a style map of a referred artwork. What are you looking at 150 years of modern art in the blink of an eye? To have a closer observation, figure A and B share several same characteristics. For example, Impressionism and Post-Impressionism are always close, which explains uh, they are very similar in low-level and high-level features. In the referred style map, we use a red box to indicate the style movements that are always closer to each other in both generated maps. We have more detailed explanation towards the style characteristics corresponding to the distance maps in our paper. And uh, this is the framework of how we construct the style space. We first verify the correctness and the feasibility of our interactive style space and validate style interpolation within the space. Then we perform interpolation to generate the style innovation results. And uh, this is some comparison examples generated by our method and other two representative multi-style transfer methods. And more details are explained in our paper. Here are four examples of our style innovation results. The, co the content image in, is in the right corner of each image. And uh, these are two papers we published towards this topic. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, I think that's all. Th thank you, uh, Bing Queen. Uh, Jenny's, uh, please. Ebra, could I just ask, after, after next talk, I would uh, play, play the video for Isa. He couldn't get in, so I got his ah, video. Okay. So you have the video for Anissa. Okay, good. After next one. Yes, next, that's okay. Uh, Jenis, please. Yep. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Janice. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my work, Cast Gan, done with my supervisor, Professor Andrea Cavallaro. So our work is on underwater images that you can see on the left. They are degraded by light attenuation that cause the color cast and the blurring effect. This degradation highly depends on the water environment. That's why you, here you see two images under different color cast. And it also depends on the depth of the scene under the water surface and the objects range from the camera. So nowadays we'll just naturally ask, can we just train a neural network to remove the color cast? Well, to train it, we need the training data set that consists of the degradation the image and the corresponding reference image. Uh, so the existing approach, they have two options. Either they use surrogate reference images that are still under the color cast, or they just uh, synthesized the images using a physics-based model. However, they still have limited color diversity and not all the degradations are modeled. So we asked one question, can we 
uh, synthesized a training data set covering all the degradation causes and also has a diverse color distribution. We propose one solution to use computer generated images. Uh, in particular, we use the Sintel data sets by taking the luminous and the object segmentation that goes through a recoloring process. So you see that is our synthesized image on the right. On top of this image, we also uh, implement a range dependent scattering using successive Gaussian blurring. So here you see objects that are further away the, from the camera are more blurred. So uh, we also use the empirical data to synthesize of different water environment and depth. Therefore, we can synthesize uh, the images for 10 gel of water types, as you can see here. So that's about the training data set. Of course, again, itself about the architecture, it, we quite simply use six ResNet block as the generator, and we design loss function that encourage the color accuracy and the blurring. So let's see what color can, cast scan can do on the two images that we've seen before. That's the first one, and here's the second one. So as you can see, color cast scan can successfully remove the color cast in the image and really enhance the appearances of objects. We also did a bit of comparison with state-of-the-art methods, as you can see here. And we also conducted a subjective experiment just to validate uh, the cast removal that uh, by the result, color ca uh, cast scan is superior in the subjective experiment. So this concludes our work and all of the results are online in the website you can see here. I'll be very happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we are going to play the um, presentation from Isa, Isa Khalife. So Chan is so kind to play it. Hello there, my name is Isa Khalifi and I'm from the MMV department in X. Today's topic is deep learning for video frame interpolation. So you might be wondering, what is video frame interpolation? It's just simply the process of generating new frames from existing ones. So if you had a 30 FPS video, you want to make it 60, interpolation could be used for this matter. The many applications for interpolations, it could be used for the adaptation of older TV content on newer high frame TVs, it could be used for the creation of slow motion videos, it could be used for gaming, the other applications as well. Traditional optical film networks would be used for this matter, so they measure the motion between the two input frames to create the uh, to create the interpolated frame. However, there are problems with occlusions, the sudden brightness change, and blurriness. So all of these could lead to incorrect motion vector calculation, which would might lead to artifacts within the interpolated frame. Uh, so there's been a growth in kernel-based methods, which theoretically should be able to handle the this issue a bit better. Uh, so this is an example of a kernel-based method. So this uh, encoder-decoder architecture here is used to extract the features from the two input images here. These input images are stacked in the channel dimension. Uh, the features extracted are then input to four subnetworks, which output the horizontal and vertical kernels for each respective image. These horizontal and vertical kernels are then converged with the input images, each respective input image, and then the output from this is then just added together to get an interpolated frame. So we propose an improvement to SEPCON, which would mean that we use dilation in the feature extraction part of the network, and we'd remove this middle block here, and we'd also configure the dilation, use a different combination of dilations and strides to simulate the pooling operation. All of this results in uh, this network using significantly fewer parameters, so approximately 7.5% of the original parameters. It performs on the middle degree other benchmark and uses less training data compared to the original model. However, we still don't know whether or not this is due to um, this is due to um, the training method or the dilations or a combination of both. So our relation test needs need to happen to be able to determine where the uh, what actually causes this boost in performance. So if you can see, um, in all these testing sets, the dilation model performs better. Uh, here's an example of the interpolated frame here. So the far right is the dilation model's output. If you can see, the ball is better synthesized here compared to the sepcon version. Uh, here, the pole is better synthesized. And if you can see here, the leg is also better synthesized. Here is arguable whether or not there's a boost in performance for, for, for this one but I thought it included. Um, 
Anyways, so for potential feature work, uh, we need to identify where this improvement occurs compared to the original. We need to look at creating a joint deep learning interpolation algorithm because these things usually go hand in hand. And with deep learning, if the if the image is less uh, blurry, you actually should get better interpolation results. Thank you for listening to this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, thank you, Sean, uh, uh, for playing the uh, video of ISA. Uh, now we have the last, the closing presentation of these uh, two sessions, and after that we will have the Q and A session. Um, the last presentation is by Alessio Sompero. Alessio, can you yes. hear me? Yes. Okay. Go, go on, please. Are you having problems sharing the screen, Alessio? Yes, he doesn't recognize the video. <clears throat> Did you send to us the video? Yeah, and I think now I can see it. Sorry for the delay. Okay, can you see it? Are you able to see the video? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Alessio, and I'm very glad to present to you my recent work published in International Conference on acoustic speech and signal processing, along with my collaborators, Ricardo Sanchez Matilla, Postolos Modas, Pascal Fusar, and Racalalao. So in our work, we were interested in how we could reconstruct the shape of an object that is unknown to a vision system consisting of two uh, camera uh, with a wide baseline, and also how we could estimate the dimensions from the shape of the object in 3D, which I mean here by dimension is width and height, especially we assume that there is no prior knowledge in terms of 3D object model uh, of, the, of the object to the vision system. No marker can be put on top of the object to simplify the estimation and uh, no that data is available. So to address this problem, we propose LODE, which stands for localization of the dimension estimator. And here you can see the object stands on a tabletop in a prior position, it's completely visible to both camera viewpoint and the object has a circular symmetric shape. So this is our assumption. And also we assume that the cameras as completely known uh, poses. So the first step of our approach is to localize the object in each image plane. And we do so by using instant segmentation that gave us an object mask of our container of interest. And from the object mask, what we do is we estimate the centroid, assuming that this centroid is the most reliable correspondence that we can find between the views, especially when the object is without any texture or is transparent. Then we use a very well-known technique in computer vision triangulation to estimate the centroid in 3D from the, 2D, from the correspondence of the 2D centroid. We also then initialize an hypothetical shape here, a cylinder that consists of multiple circumferences sampled at different height with respect to the estimate of the centroid. And also we sample multiple 3D points for each circumferences. So after that, what we want to do is to find the real shape of this object and we adopt an iterative approach where we project the 3D points into the 2D uh, camera view of both cameras, and we check that all the points belonging to circumferences lies on both object masks. So as you can see here, the, a circumference that didn't converge has red points. When the, the points lies on both object masks, the point become green. When the circumference doesn't converge, we reduce the radius in an iterative way until we can reach a minimum point. So here you can see the results of our approach. There are some limitations, especially with transparent uh, glasses where uh, the segmentation sometimes fails or is a little bit inaccurate and with some objects that are not really circular, so we have some inaccurate estimation. But overall, across many different objects, especially symmetric one, we're able to reconstruct the actual shape and also estimate their, their dimension. So here, these objects are collected on purpose for this uh, work and we got more than 1,000 images to actually assess um, the 
the performance of our approach, which overall looks quite uh, reasonable. Um, welcome back to uh, the um, X seminars for uh, multimedia and computer vision. We are in the second uh, part of uh, today's presentations and we will start with the four talks on person and actual recognition. Those uh, talks will be followed by presentations on medical image analysis and we will conclude this session with two presentations on audiovisual processing. Um, let us start with uh, Gavin Hu, uh, who will present uh, his uh, work on uh, tracklet uh, self-supervised yes. learning or unsupervised person re-identification. Uh, Gavin, please uh, do share your screen with the uh, slides and over to you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Oh. Okay. Hi, I'm Kevin from Vision Group. In this work, we propose a check exchange supervised learning method for unsupervised person re identification. This is a joint work by Kevin, Eddie, and Sean. As shown in this figure, given a prof image of person of interest, we need to find and match people across different camera views distributed at different locations. Traditional person re ID methods are mainly following supervised learning pipelines, which require manual annotation and are impractical in real application. So in this work, we propose an unsupervised person re ID method to automatically learn from unlabeled data. Different from existing unsupervised person re ID methods, we exploit the intrinsic checklist structure to eliminate the need for both person identity and camera labels on changing data. And we propose a checklist shelf supervised learning objective for different aspects of shelf supervision mining. As shown in this figure, we propose to exploit the Checklist FAM coherence learning, checklist neighborhood coherence learning, and checklist cluster coherence learning to form the uh, comprehensive learning objective so that we can optimize an uh, embedding space for person ID matching. And we conducted extensive experiment on various large scale person ID benchmarks and the experimental result show the effectiveness of our method over the state of the art methods. And more importantly, our method is a free and supervised personal writing method so that we can automatically learn from uh, unlabeled data. So this is our work proposed, uh, published in AI. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Gavin. Um, let's uh, now move on to the second presentation. And Samadhi, could you please start sharing uh, your screen? Um, um, yes, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, very well. So okay. uh, Samadhi will present uh, her work on self-supervised domain learning for uh, face recognition in the wild. Over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Samadhi and Professor Ebron is my PhD supervisor. Let me present to you my PhD work where I aim to develop a domain learning framework targeting unconstrained face recognition. Unconstrained face recognition is extremely challenging due to variations like illumination, pose, sensor quality, and etc. It creates a gap between trained data, which is usually large volumes of good quality images, to different target data. So how do we transfer the knowledge effectively from trained data to different application data? Now let's see how the brain works. This image contains faces of six different individuals. And at first glance, it's difficult to say which images belong to one individual. But after a while, we get used to the data and we start to see discriminations. I want to find out if we can train a deep network to supervise itself into adapting to different application data. We can achieve such learning by either training or fine tuning on application data but not all applications provide labeled data. 
So we present a learning solution based on unlabeled data and solve it by alternatively generating pseudo labels. In doing that, we face two main challenges. Number one is how to generate pseudo labels accurately. And even the unlabeled data can be limited. So how do we train networks without overfitting? Addressing our first challenge of generating pseudo labels, we use hierarchical clustering to group domain data into identity clusters. Hierarchical clustering offer a high reliability in early iterations. We use these confident clusters as our pseudo trained data. And when the network is trained and is better adapted to the domain, we use it to obtain a better clustering result and more accurate and informative training samples. To avoid network overfitting, we try to select the critical training samples and fin filter out the less informative. In our sample mining algorithm, we select samples that are informative but are also not too hard to train a swamp our training process. And we also consider the possible error introduced in the previous clustering step. We perform evaluations on four face recognition benchmarks. Our evaluations show that uh, when we use the domain blind samples, that is our first training cycle, it achieves some level of adaptation. But our second training cycle, which is uh, training on domain aware samples, adapts better and provide highly competitive results when we compare it with the state of the art. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Samadhi, for the presentation. Uh, let's now move on to uh, Georgios. Um, would you please uh, share your screen? Uh, Giorgio will present uh, his PhD work on a few shot and zero shot action recognition using temporal attentive relation networks. Over to you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hello, my name is Georgios Sumpurlis, and I will present you the joint work with Nina Bisai and Ioannis Patras on TARN, Temporal Attentive Relation Network for few shot and zero shot action recognition that has been published in BMVC 2019. The standard process of training machine learning models involves, uh, involves using large amounts of data to learn its class. Then during testing, the trained model gets a video as input and predicts its class label. In the few-shot learning scenario, our model is tested on classes which are not present in a training set and for which only a very small amount of data is available. Hence, a good starting point to address the few-shot learning problem is to pre-train a machine learning model in a large training set and then explore ways to generalize on the new test classes. The entire pipeline of our proposed architecture for the case of few-shot learning, called TARN, is shown in this figure. We use a similarity model that is trained to classify by, by comparing a query video to a few labeled videos of the sample set. Initially, each entire video is split into multiple 16-frame segments, and then these segments are are the inputs of the embedding module, which consists of a special temporal 3D network along with a recurrent network. The embedding module serves as visual feature extractor. We extract visual features for the sample set segments, as well as for all the query set segments, and we form pair between these features. Then we perform multiple comparisons between these segments, and we assign uh, we assign uh, the label of the class with the highest similarity to the query video. In the zero-shot learning case, instead of a few videos, we only have a single text representation for each class, and the rest of the architecture works similarly. Our results show that using multiple segment-wise representations and an attention mechanism, we can achieve state-of-the-art results on few-shot learning and perform competitively on zero-shot learning. In the future, we aim to apply this architecture in use of physiological data for emotional recognition. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Georgios, for, uh, for the presentation. And now uh, we move on to the fourth uh, presentation of this session, Person and Action Recognition. And this presentation will be delivered by uh, Ting Ting. And the title of her work is uh, Action Localization with Uncertainty Aware Networks. Ting Ting, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you say my screen right now? Yes. Okay. So let me start right now. 
Hello everyone, my name is Pingping Xie. Today I'm going to present our undersubmitted journal paper Temporal Action Localization with Varun Surveyor Networks. Our paper focuses on the task of temporal action localization, which is given a video. We need to decide what kind of action happens and when does each action start and end. The classical approach of CN based methods is to prepare a set of video clips and then feed them to detector to do classification to decide the action category and the regression to refine the boundaries. However, as the video clips may have different lines, we need to fix their feature dimension to fade to the same detector, which is done by pulling. Given a video clip of n frames, to reduce it to be k frames, putting operation average the feature of n by k frames here. However, applying pulling operation in this way will lose some information. So, in this paper, we propose to use Gaussians to represent the feature. The baseline detection pipeline is like this. Uh, in our network, the input are multiple Gaussians. We propagate both mean and the variances through different layers to the end. Now we only focus on the regression part. The output of the network are two Gaussians for the offside to the start and end. The means are the offside. The variances will be considered as uncertainties towards the offside prediction. From this table, our network and the baseline network are raised the same number of parameters. So it indicates our network do this without introducing any learnable parameters. In this figure, we show an example of ground truth in green bars and predictions in red bars. Predicted Gaussians could be seen in bell curves here. We can tell when our predictions are close to the ground truth. Our network are certain about the predictions, so the predicted variances tend to be relatively small and vice versa. This indicates the validness of our predictions. In this table, we show the result comparison between baseline and ours. Show that under different configurations, our network outperformed baseline by more than 1% without introducing any extra learnable parameters. That's all for the presentation. Thanks for listening. Thank you, uh, Ting Ting. Um, this uh, concludes the uh, person and action recognition uh, section of uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, we are now moving on to uh, the health and uh, medical image analysis uh, session. Um, is uh, uh, Shingru around? The first presenter? Hello? Or... Yes. Okay. So uh, over to you for uh, uh, your presentation on lumen and media border detection in intravascular ultrasound sequences using attention unit. Okay. Um... Sorry. <laughs> so um, my topic here is about IVUS ED frame detection and simulation. So IVUS uh, is simply just uh, put a sensor into your vessels and to film me inside your vessels to see if there are any problems in your vessels. And uh, you can see here the main, the main task here is to annotate the inner vessel wall, which are called lumen or the out vessel wall. And the, because it's a video and it's filming, filming the vessels around your heart because your heart beats periodically. So you can see that if you look at this image here in the time axis, you will see that there's a periodically movements. This is causing by the heartbeat. And to do the annotation, to do the segmentation, you have to uh, find that specific frame where the vessel string to the smallest place that's what we call it the n frame or ED frame. So uh, first we need to find those ED frames. So in this, in this task, we uh, will create a, a small data set and we do some encoding of the, this video and uh, uh, put it into a recurrent neural network. And then you can see 
uh, you can see the result by accuracy. The first column is uh, automatic method developed by Leighton University, and the second and third are two experts annotations uh, accuracy, and the last column is our uh, results, and you can see that uh, this is the first time that we know that uh, our machine learning methodology can improve search uh, comparing with humans. And then you can see here, here are some of uh, my, uh, my results. The, the green bar shows uh, uh, network predictions and the uh, red dots shows the uh, real 80 frames. And you can see that uh, the, this method capture most of these most of the ED frames. And when you have ED frame, you can finally do the segmentation. For this task, we collected the biggest IOS data set in the world, nearly 200 vessels annotate for two years, nearly two years. And you can see some of the example here. And the main catch here in this annotation is here. You can see that there are large dark areas. You can see that there are no any border you can see from here or in this side vessel you have to imagine where where is this uh, vessel ends so there's no clear bo border you have to just use a uh, new network to imagine that and for that we we create a complex uh, method we mainly use scan for the training uh, for training and uh, we first do some uh, feature extracting to to and then, uh, and then we use, use again for the segmentation and, and do some uh, post-processing work. And then you can see that we do a lot of uh, experiment to find out the best uh, experiment. And you can see that uh, the major improvements here, you can see that in this black area for a normal unit, you cannot draw the clear boundary here, but our method in the last column can predict where there's no clear boundaries. For example, you, you can see here in these examples. And uh, we also did the comparison. Uh, okay, we did some comparison with human expert and uh, we find out that our, our method is, be, is uh, in, the, in the number, I, we think it's better than uh, all human expert annotations. And we also use a small data set to compare with previous IOS segmentation methods, and you can see the result. Uh, in this data, in this small data set, our method is better than all other previous research by a large scale. And that's the end of the my work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shinkru. Um, let's now move on to uh, the next uh, talk. Uh, he Bao. He Bao. Sun, are you around? If not, uh, Ilong? Okay, so let's uh, move on to the uh, next uh, health and medical image analysis presentation. Uh, this presentation will be given by uh, Nikki and uh, Ting Ting, if you could kindly uh, share the screen with uh, her presentation that will be appreciated. If in the, in the meantime, Hibao and Ilong uh, will um, be available, we will uh, schedule their presentation after uh, Nikki's. Sure. Okay, then I start with Nikki's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nikki Fagunabulu and I will take you through the work on vision-based estimation of schizophrenia symptoms. Mental illness affects patients' nonverbal behavior. We know that psychiatrists estimate some symptoms of schizophrenia, such as flat affect or poor report, by noticing patients' behavior throughout the interview, such as a reduction in facial expression, looking away from the interviewer, and so on. Our work focuses on quantifying patients' facial behavior, confirming correlations between facial behavior and symptom severity, and estimation of behavior-related symptoms automatically. The data used throughout the work has been collected by the New Am Center for Mental Health and is, uh, consists of videos in quasi-real um, life scenarios of patients with um, the, their psychiatrists. The architecture of SkinNet was uh, 
in four stages. In the first stage, we have face detection, where for each frame we extract the face of the patient. In the second uh, stage, we get the low-level features, which is a facial expression detection for each frame. Facial expressions contain uh, cheek raises, eyes closed, smiling, etc. In the third stage, we do get a video level representation of facial behavior using ghost and mixture models and facial vector layers. And then finally, we have the symptom regression layers and the total score prediction. For the facial analysis, we have first trained and tested uh, the model in a separate database before being applied to patients. And it's detecting 11 facial expressions in the wild. In the wild means that it is done in real life conditions from multiple angles and lightning. And this is very important as this is the um, scenario with our schizophrenia database. In terms of statistical analysis, we have seen some significant correlation between expression frequencies and severity of several behavior related symptoms. The proposed method is uh, yielding state-of-the-art results for schiz automatic schizophrenia estimation um, compared to previous methodologies used. Further work that is currently being um, done involves fusing body and face modalities, research uh, to train the network end-to-end, -end, and transfer learning from other affect problems. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Niki, for uh, your presentation. Um, and now, um, if uh, uh, Ibao... Sure, I have, I have Nibao's... Um, okay. ...record it, and I think Let's, he... Yeah, I can play that. Let me play Thank you, Sean. So the next presentation will be about uh, uh, Cynet ring cells detection in histology images with similarity learning. And the presenter is Ibao. Hello, this is Yi Bao. I'm here to give a brief introduction for our recent work on signal ring cells detection in histology images with similarity learning. You may wonder what is signal ring cell. So let's firstly have a look at some examples of signal ring cells. As it can be seen in the figure, Histology images produced by different laboratories with different devices introduce variations in color, scale, shape, and size of signal ring cells, which makes signal ring cells detection a challenging task. To address the issue, we propose to use similarity learning. Here is the framework for signal ring cells detection it takes an image as input and output prediction indicating locations and competencies for cells by using a regressor and a classifier respectively. We have trained a lot of models with different convolutional neural network backbones and loss functions. Next, I will show you some results. Here are some most positive examples detected by models with different convolutional neural network backbones and loss functions, respectively. Here is the performance of signal ring cell detection against number of training iterations. Here is the comparison of signal ring cell detection with different models convolutional neural network backbones and embedding loss functions. Thank you for listening. For more details, please don't hesitate to contact me. All right. Um, now just a one last check regarding uh, Ilong uh, presentation. If uh, we haven't got the speaker nor the presentation, we will no, we, we have, answer. Uh, Okay. So Hibao's presentation uh, closes uh, the health and medical image analysis session. Uh, now we move on to the uh, last two presentations uh, for uh, this second half of uh, the multimedia and computer vision uh, webinar.
uh, from the X Research Week. And uh, the next presenter is uh, Dr. Wong, and uh, he will be uh, talking about uh, his work on audiovisual sensing from drones. Lin, over to you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello? Yep. Okay, good. Yes. yes. Uh, Hello everyone, my name is uh, Lin, and uh, I'm a lecturer in Kumari University of London. And in this short talk, I would be very happy to introduce my research on audiovisual sensing from June. Actually, the research is mainly about the sound processing on June. We know that uh, June is becoming more and more popular in our daily life, and many people are using June to record the video from the sky but the sound of the video is usually of poor quality. This is because of the influence of the egg noise from the rotating rotor and the uh, propeller, which leads to extremely low SNR at the onboard microphone and make the sound recorded on drones completely unusable. And this is an example of the sound recorded by onboard microphone when a human is talking toward a room. And we can almost hear nothing except the room noise. And to solve this problem, we developed uh, several microphone array algorithm that can estimate the direction of the sound and also to enhance the sound with a uh, beamformer. And these are the uh, hardware prototypes we developed uh, so far. And later on, we noticed that a drone is usually equipped with a camera. Then we designed some audiovisual joint processing algorithm. And there are several people talking in front of the drone together. And we can use the computer vision algorithm to localize the human and then steer the beamformer to extract the speech from each individual speaker. Because the visual modality is uh, uh, not influenced by the acoustic noise, so the multimodal algorithm works robustly in even in very challenging scenario. And now I would like to show a demo of the audiovisual sensing framework. And this is uh, the workflow of the framework. As an example, people simultaneously talking to a mini drone. The original enhance the result. For and we can see that even several people are talking in front of the very noisy uh, sound, we can still separate them uh, uh, quite clearly. And these are our recent publication on this research topic. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Lin, uh, for the presentation. Let's now move uh, to uh, the uh, next presentation of the audio visual signal processing session. And the presenter is uh, Ashish Alex. Thank you, Andrea. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ashish Alex. I am a PhD student at CIS, supervised by Dr. Lin Wong. The title of my presentation is Noisy Speech Separation. Speech separation can be described as separating mixed speech, which can be corrupted by speech or non-speech noises in, into subsequent speakers of interest. Such a system can aid applications such as automatic speech recognition, hearing aids, captioning and transcription of videos, and human-robotic interaction. Now I'll briefly discuss the challenges associated with the problem. Firstly, the permutation problem. This refers to the channel swap during training, which can result in conflicting gradients, resulting in non-convergence of the network. Additionally, the presence of noise and or reverberation can degrade the performance of separation severely. And most real-world speech exists in diarist form, where mixtures briefly overlap, instead of complete overlap, which is on which most separation systems are trained on. 
Next, I will discuss the time, time domain data driven approach where I attempted to enhance the performance of separation system in noisy environments using noise and time frequency crowd augmentation. The time frequency crowd augmentation is inspired by spec augment paper and involves taking out random time and frequency bins from a spectral representation before fitting to the network. I use a constant based separation system, which takes in waveform as input, followed by encoder and learns representation, which can be fed to the masking network to learn respective mask for the sources in the mixture. And finally, the mask is multiplied with the learned encoder representation and uses inpo input to decoder to predict the individual waveforms. Finally, I would like to play some results of separation on noisy data. An idea is like the virus, resilient, highly contagious, and even the smallest. Now the separated waveforms using augmented model. An annotated set of scraps we can to manipulate the data for the finding. And speaker two. An idea is like the virus, resilient, highly contagious, and even the smallest. You can clearly see how the augmented model performs better. An annotated. Thank you for listening.